Live from the Business Radio X studio inside Renaissance Bank, the bank that specializes in understanding you. It's time for North Fulton Business Radio. And hello again, everyone. Welcome to yet another edition of North Fulton Business Radio. I'm John Ray, and we are still virtual. No, we're not back in our studio inside Renaissance Bank at the moment, but we hope that will come sometime soon. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, folks, uh, we'll uh, be in touch on that. And also uh, stay in touch with your folks at Renaissance. They've done a great job uh, helping small businesses through this environment. And if you're in need of a better experience for your small business uh, with your bank, uh, check them out. Uh, go see your Renaissance banker at the branch. You'll need to make an appointment. They will see you inside the branch, but you do need to make an appointment. Um, so give them a call or go to the website, renaissancebank.com. Renaissance Bank, understanding you, member FDIC. And now I want to turn to an old friend, Dr. Dion <laughs> Poulton. And uh, Dr. Dion Poulton used to be around this area, but she like bugged out on us, <laughs> right? I still, have my home. I still have my home in Gwinnett. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> that gives, that gives me hope, right? Uh, uh, no, uh, seriously, uh, uh, you're up to some good things in New England. You're now the chief diversity officer at care New England, right? That's right. Yeah. So, um, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, for those that don't know, you get, give a little uh, overview of uh, of the world of Dr. Dion Polden. Well, once again, good to be with you, John. It's been a long time, and yep. uh, I'm, I'm always great to be with you, my friend. Yep. So uh, what should I say? I started off as a high school teacher. I taught for about six years, and that uh, morphed into teaching at the university level. And I came into diversity just kind of just by chance. I kind of fell into it. Uh, long story short, I was teaching a grade nine boys class and discovered that they were pretty successful in my class and not in others. And not because I lowered the standards, but because I realized there was something happening in that transaction. There was something that was, I didn't know what it was. And that led me to do, to do some research. So I did my master's degree in San Francisco, looking at the multicultural um, implications of ed education and how teacher teacher comfort levels and um, with respect to race as well. And then that led me to do my PhD at the University of Georgia. And I looked at the unconscious biases of educators, not just in K through 12, but ed uh, educators in all different industries from, from entertainment to law. Um, and just to, to see if there was any, um, uh, what's the word, any consistency or, or, or there's any, any, any common experience amongst all the educators. And it was determined, uh, surprised, that everybody has biases. And that's regardless of age, race, profession, we all have them. And uh, so that's that's what I um, did for my research. And then after that, I started my own business. And uh, that's why I ended up meeting you and uh, yeah. Mike Salmon. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and actually, Mike uh, Salmon, to, to give a little, a little, a little uh, plug here, He's the one that uh, in, uh, interviewed me the first time with Radio X and then said, hey, you want to try having a show? And so I tried that and I loved it. And so I've actually been doing it for now. This is the fourth year, which is crazy. So, yeah. but anyway, but I, but I, I, I credit both of you, both you and, and Mike, and I, I just, I miss you guys. Well, we miss you, but uh, we can connect with you, as you said, through your podcast. So it, it's the Dr. Dion show. And, uh, you, you've kind of re, re, uh, engineered or re, uh, in, energized that uh, is the word I'm trying to, uh, get to, uh, here lately and, and, and put out some more episodes. So congratulations on that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yeah. And I think part of what you have done in that show is really, it really kind of lights the trail for those that don't know how to respond to all they see right now and that is to to uh, uh ask questions and listen yes that very simple yet rare art of asking <laughs> questions waiting for an answer and listening absolutely right and uh that's one thing that you especially in diversity that's something that you have to do in order to get it right one of the uh, um uh so 
people are going to think I'm like Dr. Dion's PR person, but I want to push your book too. So I'm pushing your podcast, <laughs> but also you've got a new book coming out and we won't get into that yet. But, um, but you've, you wrote a book a few years ago called it's not always racist, but sometimes it is, which I highly recommend to people if they have not read the book. And one of the things that you talk about in that book is the difference between racism and bias. Why don't you unpack that? Sure. And thanks for that. And I do, I did that uh, back in 2014, actually. And I wrote that book after the, uh, the senseless killing of um, Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. And I was frustrated looking at the news and uh, people talking about the, the incident and uh, trivializing whether it was racist or whether it was not. And just, there was, and I realized there needed to be some clarity in terms of terminolo terminology. So, and that was just three, three years after I got my doctorate at UGA in the same area. So nonetheless, I wrote the book. So racism put simply through my research is it's, you can think of an equation. It's called racism equals prejudice plus power. So it's prejudice plus power, meaning that person who has the prejudice has to have the ability to stop somebody else, whether uh, physically, emotionally, socially, to achieve what they want, to achieve their ideals. On the other hand, bias is just that. It's just bias. It's a, it's a prejudgment. And everybody has that. All of us have it, regardless of, of who we are, as I, as I stated. And, the, and it's a natural um, brain function. So, um, so to speak, we the brain naturally uh, makes sense of the world by category, categorizing and um, compartmentalizing. So it's a natural function. But where we get into trouble is when we start to assign um, value or devalue people based upon our misperceptions and our and our biases. So so that's that's the distinction. So let's talk about what is happening right now. And I guess a couple of things. One is I think there are a lot of um, white folks that are caught by surprise. And they don't understand the depth of what's happening. And maybe some of them discount it because they think all this is just going to blow over. But this what it, what has happened over the last few weeks, I think for those that are maybe a little more aware feels a lot different. Absolutely. And I've been saying just in conversations uh, with the, with the staff where I am that this is, and I put out a statement myself and this feels different and it is different. And I'll tell you why many people have been killed um, uh, in the past. Many unarmed black men have been killed in the past, but I think the difference here is we almost watched it in real time. There was a video rolling of a police officer with his knee on George Floyd's neck. And I spoke to a friend of mine who was a former police chief, and he kind of described it as it being in slow motion. Mm. And that's the way it, it felt. And so for that officer to casually and callously have his knee on George Floyd's neck with his hand in his pocket, almost like he was posing for the camera, it, it was it, it was it was shocking, utter disbelief. And I'll tell you, John, I have never witnessed a murder in my life. And using that word is difficult, but the officer was charged with murder. So essentially, we all individually and collectively witnessed a murder. And it's riveting. And there's no speculation as to what happened? Did he do something wrong? It just is it, all there on tape for eight minutes and 46 seconds. This morning, I'll share um, at one of the hospitals where I work at, we at Women and Infants Hospital in, New, in uh, Rhode Island, the residents, the physicians said, we want to do something. So they organized a silent protest. We had the media there. It was streamed live on Facebook. And we said our words at the beginning, myself and the, and the CEO, and then we had to kneel for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Mm. And I have to tell you, I, it took everything in me not to cry. 
eight minutes and 46 seconds feels like an eternity. And the difference is with what happened today, and I can't even imagine how George Floyd felt, was that I knew at the 46 second of the eight of the eight minute that I was going to be able to stand up and walk off and be fine. Right. But he didn't have that opportunity. He suffered a slow death and he suffered. He called for his mother. Yes. So I just, it, it's so, so to go back to your question, I don't know who can look at that and not be changed. I don't know who can look at that and trivialize it and not say, you know what? Something needs to be done. So um, if I can, I mean, how are you doing in all this? I mean, because you, you've got a professional uh, stake in all this, a professional obligation. You're shepherding a organization of 8,000 employees through this time. And, but how are you doing in all this? Thank you for for asking. It's interesting because in after I, I released a statement, um, myself and uh, the CEO, we we decided to host a a, a, a town hall basically for all of the employees, mm. and I shared a story. Actually, I'll share with you. It's relevant to to, to Georgia. I when I was driving uh, um, to University of Georgia doing my doctorate. I was in the car and I saw a police officer that was on, um, I didn't remember what the name of the highway is now. And um, I passed the, the, the officer and I, I knew, I knew I'd be pulled, pulled over. And it was a two lane highway. It was me and another truck. And I was keeping my distance. The police officer pulled, pulled me over and he walked up to the car and I'd been taught to kind of just be friendly and, and, and speak first. So the officer came and I said, hi officer, how you doing? He goes, Oh, um, oh, you, you, you changed, you changed too close to that truck. And I'm thinking, sure I did. And he goes, can I have your license? I said, sure. I gave him my license. He checked me out. He came back and he goes, okay, you're good to go. No ticket, no warning, no nothing. Then I had to continue on to school. I had to sit in my class at UGA. Like that didn't happen. Like mm-hmm. I wasn't terrified right. and I didn't have to focus on my schoolwork. And I share this story as I did with the employees because to use, to use a, a, a social work term, people of color and black people in this situation are forced to separate and function. We have to separate all of the junk that we go through in order to function and still be expected to function normally. So to go back to your question, it's been very, it has been very difficult. And, and I think it is important for people to ask each other, how are you doing? And not just how are you doing and keep walking. It's how are you doing and wait for the answer. Actually ask right. <laughs> and wait for the answer and be ready for the answer. And so I appreciate you. You're the second person to ask me this question, like really without being prompted. So thank, thank you, John. And I'm doing okay. I have uh, a great support system. I make sure that I laugh every day. Even if it means putting on a comedy to laugh, I do that. Um, I like to still work out. I listen to music. I just try to make sure that I um, spend time for myself and my kids bring me joy as well. So, so that's the, that's, that's how I survived this. But in addition to that, this is, this is, you know, when you know you're, you've been born to do something, Hmm. this is in me, this is, this is what I do and it's what I love and what I believe I'm good at. So it doesn't feel like it's a job. This feels like I'm just, it's an extension of what, why God put me on this, on this, on this earth. And a lot of, well, there, there's no white, there's nobody that's white that understands the concept of racial trauma. I mean, let's just say that, right? So talk about racial trauma, talk about what um, incidents like this do to, black employees in the workplace and why it's a tough time for them right now. Very tough time for them right now, uh, to function normally at work. Like, you know, I, I, I put it in that context because we're, you know, we're a business show and we got business owners listening to this show and company executive lists, 
company executives listening to the show. So maybe we can put it in that context. Sure. And so I'll, and I'll put it in the context of just the work that I've done. So I knew it was important when we recognized what was happening, I knew it was important to put out a statement. I knew it, is, it was important for the employees to have an outlet with which to speak and to be heard. And I knew it was important to meet with the employees. And I w- I've been doing a lot of just individual um, um, sessions with different departments. I can't even tell you how many hundreds of, of, of employees I've trained in the last couple of weeks. Mm. And in the context of a workplace, I will say to anyone listening who's, in, who's the head of a company or a business, if you have not addressed this yet, you have failed your employees. Because, again, it's the separating function. If your employees, and I know we, with respect to COVID, we're, we're now at home and, and working remotely, but, it, but it, we're still being affected by that, by, by, by that. And so the racial trauma that you just shared is... It's, it's extremely difficult to, to separate. So for example, when we saw, everyone saw George Floyd on, 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 on the ground, basically. And as a black person, I could not help but substitute and say, that could have been me. That could have been my husband. That could have been my brother. It could have been my cousin, my uncle, my nephews. And so there's, we can't, it's hard to separate. And, and because it was so random and because he did nothing except perhaps maybe they think they allegedly he passed a, 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 a dummy $20 bill. Does, does that warrant him losing his life? Mm. And so, and we, and we also know, we, you know, we look at, look at, um, um, uh, Ahmad, um, what's his last name? Sorry. Ahmad, um, uh, um Arbery. The gen- Arbery, sorry. Mm-hmm. The gentleman yeah. who was, he was jogging. Right. In in, here Georgia. in Georgia. Mm-hmm. In Georgia, mm-hmm. he was jogging. Right. How many times have I gone out jogging? Mm. So, so the, the 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 trauma here is that the system of racism exists that, that we're always functioning under, anyways. And I'll, and so I'll, and with that, I'll say that so in this system of racism, it assumes a pervasive white cultural norm, and that means that that everything the way this system is is designed is for white people. And I know it's hard to digest and it's hard to hear, but essentially when we think about it, the lighter you are, the greater the opportunities you have, the lighter you are, even the prettier you are, that's right. The, the prettier you are. Um, if the lighter you are, the, the, the more benefit the doubt that you get, if you're darker skinned, you are, you can, you, you're more likely to be considered a criminal. And I'm, and I'm going to give an example. I can put on the most beautiful dress or suit and I can go into any store and still be followed because people don't know my education. They don't know anything about me, but unfortunately we have been taught what skin color is and what it means. And it's unfortunate. And I'm going to, and you, you did reference white people, but I got to tell you, I've had black people do the same thing to me. <laughs> I've had Indian people do the same thing to me and yeah. Asian people. So it's right. not just white, black. We have been, and, and I'm saying we have been inundated with messaging from the media and different places about who, who is more valuable than others. If we think about the, the word native American, mm. I'm I, you, you line up 10 people. I'm sure eight out of at least eight of them will have something negative things to say about them because that's the way we, we've been taught about who people are and whose lives are worth more. Mm. And so that's why in my teachings and in my approach to this work, it's, it's te- telling people to be cognizant all the time of what you believe. Where did, why do you believe what you believe? Where did you learn what you believe? And how can you unlearn some of the junk that we all have in our minds that we don't even know that's operating in our minds and, that, and, that's, and then that's playing out in the workplace and playing out in the things that we're doing with, with other people? Uh, you mentioned something really important there, um, as, as folks, we talk with Dr. Dion Poulton, um, who is the chief diversity officer at care new England and, and, uh, the host of, uh, Dr. Dion show, uh, you mentioned something very important there. And that is the things that we have learned that are under the surface that we don't even know we we've learned. I mean, that's another way of saying unconscious bias. 
exactly. Yes. And we all have it. We all have them. And I, I can't, you know, I, I sit here as the so-called expert, but I, I have them as well. We all have them. But the, the goal is how do you mitigate those unconscious biases? What do you do to, um, to, to, to make sure that when you're in the moment that you're not necessarily caught? So, so one thing I did learn through my research is the more that you are cognitively tired or preoccupied, the more likely your biases will come out. Mm. So perfect. Let me give an example. So um, after the most recent one, I would say is when Kobe Bryant passed away, there was a reporter who was talking about the LA, the LA Lakers. And the, she, she inadvertently said the LA, I think she said the, the N word and you can, we can Google it and look it up. Oh my. And, and so, Oh yeah. And so, and so she, she said that and it kind of rolled off her tongue because she was cognitively preoccupied. Mm. And so the lesson there is if we don't do the work and, and we don't make sure that we are really, really trying to do the, trying to be better in terms of, in terms of what we think it comes out and it comes out when we're, when we're, when we're tired. So that's, that's an example of, of how things can just kind of roll off the tongue and people not even realizing. Another example is, uh, I think last year, uh, there was a, a, a meteorologist who was talking about, um, he's, he's representing the park in Martin Luther King Day. And he was on air and was looking at the, we're looking at the video and he said, oh yes. And he said, I'm paraphrasing. Oh, look at the picture on Martin Luther King Day. That's what he said. Mm. And it, he was, and it was, he was immediately fired and he swore up and down. No, I would never say that on air. Da, da, da. But again, when you are preoccupied, what you really think and what you've said a thousand times <laughs> will come out. <laughs> right. And so, so back to your question, back to what you're saying. That's why I, I always advocate. Don't just order from a beautiful uh, Chinese food restaurant, go to Chinatown. When you go on vacation, of course, there's some safety issues in some places, but don't just stay on the resort. How about go into the local areas, mingle with the people, get some immersive um, options or uh, opportunities to really, really, really get to meet other people. Go visit a black church, go to a mosque, go to different places, because that's the way that you reduce prejudices. And that's by having meaningful episodes of contact with people. That's the only way. Not saying I got a black neighbor or I got a, I got a white neighbor. It's having meaningful um, connections with people. And that's the way you really, really learned how to break down biases. And that's more than just having, uh, your black friend you've always had. I mean, right. That, <laughs> I mean, exactly. it, it's, it's going, uh, not just one step beyond several steps beyond that. Right. I mean, it, that, that it's, it's about seeking out uncom sometimes uncomfortable situations that, that, may end up uncomfortable because you're in a place you don't where your bearings are off. That's right. And we, and sometimes we do have to actually intentionally try to cultivate those kind of relationships. So, so you and I, we've, I've known you now for years and, you know, we've developed, we've established a friendship. You're a, a white man and I'm a black woman. And um, I, I, I've met your daughter. I've talked to your daughter. I know about your family and you know about my family and, and that, and, and people will think, Oh, that's just, you know, that's not, that's unusual. It's not unusual because you and I were both open mm. and we, we, we met each other uh, beyond business. And you have always, I'm going to say right here, you have always been in my corner and I appreciate you all. I mean, to no end, you've always been backing me. And so it's important to try and seek out those kind of friendships. You have no idea what you're missing if you don't try and just go outside your own comfort zones. And so I asked the question, including in my book, who's your dentist? Who is your doctor? Mm. Where do you live? Who do you invite over for dinner to your house? Mm. Who, whose house do you go to for dinner? Right. Who, who do you invite to conversations? Who do you go to, to lunch with at work, at, your, at work? And if all those people are largely monolithic, then you have intentionally created a life of lookalikes. And so you want to look into yourself and say, okay, so why have I created that kind of atmosphere to live in? It's 2020 and we're in a diverse community. So why have I intentionally created an environment that is monolithic to live in? And it's, a, it's important to ask that question. Let's talk a, a little bit about um, another incident. 
if you don't mind. Um, sure. So it's one thing to talk about um, what happened to George Floyd, which is it, it, it is murder. I mean, let's just say that um, because that's what it was. Um, I was struck by the incident that occurred in Central Park. And I'm struck by it because that's the one, and I know it doesn't involve murder, but that's the one nobody's talking about, or seemingly less so. And that's the one that involves a situation where a white woman um, calls in, really weaponizes this man's race against him, black man's Mm -hmm. race against him. Someone who happens to be in charge of the Audubon Society, he's, they're watching birds for crying out loud, and um, she doesn't have her dog on the leash like she's supposed mm-hmm. to in that part of the park, apparently. I don't know what part of the park that is, but apparently that's the rule, and he's trying to make that right and get her in compliance with what's supposed to be going on there, and she calls the police and makes up a story. Now, it's one thing to talk about police misconduct, and we can all, you know, march about that. But that's a little closer to home, (laughs) right? I mean, that's something that um, gets into uh, weaponizing race that any of us can be guilty of. Absolutely. And so you you started off by saying, um, that it was different than the George Floyd murder, murder, and that it did not end up in murder. But you know what, John? It could have. It could have, yeah, for sure. If the wrong officer showed up, it could have, and I'll I'll tell you why. So that woman in Central Park knew her privilege. She knew, as a white woman, that if she called the police, that the police will show up and they will believe her right. over the black man. And that goes back to what I said, that there's this, that we have, the people are, some people are stigmatized. Some people are assumed criminals before we even know. Um, we, we know his credentials. You just shared them. But not everyone sees that. They, they see the skin color and they decide, okay, oh, white woman, black man. There's also a gender dynamic there as well. But if not for that video, it probably would have been very different. It probably would have been a different outcome. And what she did there was extremely scary. And we know historically that, and, and and I'm I'm just doing real talk here. Historically, a lot of people, black men, lost their lives when because when when white women said that black men did whatever to them, and right. Emmett Till came to mind. That was circulating a lot on 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 Twitter, sure. and that is a, a, a it's it, it has happened historically. So that also. That incident also kind of ties to. I actually wrote. I actually wrote an article in Forbes um, talking about the Starbucks issue. Mm. The same situation. So we had black men sitting in Starbucks, just mind their own business, and the white um, barista called the police, assuming that they were they were they were they were they were um, they they were criminals. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a parallel there. And, and one thing, I, and I mentioned that article because I said in that article that that was not unconscious bias. People, that's another, another thing that people kind of just, they get mixed up. That was conscious bias. She consciously saw those two black men in, the, in, the, in Starbucks, went to the phone and called the police. Hmm. She did not do that unconsciously. Right, right. <laughs> Much like the woman in, in Central Park. Mm-hmm. She actually said, she articulated, I'm going to call the police and tell them an African-American man is, is threatening me. On camera, mm. Mm. so that's you. You can't be more conscious. You you, you can't be more aware of what you're, what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And, but then that, and then I'll just tie that back to the system and, and and with 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 racism, and that's the structure of racism that allows that to continue to happen. Because again, as I said, we live in a culture that assumes a white cultural norm, and it also assumes that white people are right. So when an officer shows up the white person always gets the benefit of the doubt and it's, and sorry to say it, but that's, but that's the case. And it's up to us as people of color to prove, no, 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 no. You got it wrong. No, no, no. We didn't do anything wrong. 
So it's it's a very complex thing, and that goes back to the trauma that that you that you asked about. It's when you live under that consistent and and persistent state of what's going to happen now. Something happened to me. Is someone going to um you know cross the street because they see me? Uh, when we follow them, follow them in in the um in a store, someone going to lock the doors. You know, I'm clutch their purse. I mean, it's 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 daunting. It's it really can get exhausting. And and now that I'm actually in healthcare, you know, it's it's we talk about health disparities a lot. And so it's not a, a surprise that um, people of color um, have higher blood pressure or black people have high, 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 higher blood pressure. Because when you are living on a, under a constant state of, of stress, that, that hormone the, the, or the, the cortisone um, levels, I mean, of course it's going to, it's going to, it's going to affect you over time. So things need to change. We're speaking with Dr. Dion Poulton, and uh, she is the Chief Diversity Officer at CARE New England. Uh, Dion, I'm interested in, I guess it would seem to me that um, companies are figuring out that their diversity program is not quite adequate. Is that a fair, <laughs> is that a fair statement? Um I mean, because that's, that's, that word has been, um, the, the, the edges of that word that ought to stay there have been rounded off a little bit. Maybe, maybe that's the way to say it Mm. over the years. Yeah. I think, I think this situation with, with the George Floyd, I, I think it's really, um, it's, it's opened up many things, including also a glimpse into how organizations are run and, it's 2020 and organizations uh, I know many of them have actually been, have been kind of caught off guard because they never believed that diversity was really important. But we do know that diver- that the more research shows that the more diverse teams, um, the more, uh, the more diverse a, a team is, the more productive they are, the more innovative they are, and they also make more money. So from the, from the business sense uh, for, for a company not to, have diversity that's you're actually missing the mark and you're and you're missing out on on it's first of all it's the right thing to do to be inclusive but you're also missing 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 out on potential profits absolutely oh and by and the way their their stock outperforms so let's throw that in there too by the way that's there you go. that's been documented too so th- th- this is a my this, this is documented research we're talking about here so exactly yeah. exactly mm-hmm. exactly and then in terms of these situations uh it's it's we no longer have this 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 public private domain anymore. Social media has has really blurred those lines, and so when something happens in society, we we, we don't just leave and then come back in into our businesses or into our homes and oh it's all over. No, we are inundated with messaging all the time. We we don't th- things don't get turned off, and mm-hmm. so it's it's it is actually not fair for employees um, to go into the workplace and expect things not to be addressed. Mm. They can't just turn things off. They have to be able to go into the workplace and say, you know what, this is what happened. That's happening in society. And this is how it's affected me because it affects your work. It affects how people do their job. And so that's why it's extremely important to make sure you have not just have a diversity person in, in place, but somebody who knows what they're doing. Because I've also seen situations where people just, oh yeah, I'm going to create the position. I'm just throw somebody in there. No, mm-hmm. and I, I make the analogy, John. I say, I say, so I like to pay. I pay the finances in my home. I I, I, I handle all the bills. Mm-hmm. That does not mean that I'm qualified to be a, a chief a chief um, financial officer, right? Yeah, sure. But many people assume, oh, because I'm a person of color, or because I I read this course, or because I read this book, that somehow I'm an expert. No, it, it this isn't it, this is an actual position. Um, and it takes years of experience to do this right and to respond right. And, and in the context of, of responses, if things are not handled properly, a person can actually do extra damage or more damage, um, to employees than, 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 than the, than the, the initial thing, because it wasn't handled properly and they can kind of re-traumatize people and, and say, you know what, this person doesn't get it. And then it evokes anger. So when we have these discussions, it has to be done properly. And how do, how do I know if I if I'm a company I'm I'm you know legitimately trying to get it right, um, 
And that's what my motivation is. I mean, how do I know that I'm on the right track with my diversity program? I think it's important to survey your, your employees all the time. So a big part of, um, you know, we, we discussed my business, but the part of a big part of uh, my business um, in, when, when I was consulting and, and still a little bit now, but when I consult is, is doing surveys that can be presented to the employees. And so you ask them outright, mm. how, are we, how are we doing? What's your experience been like? How are your managers responding to you? Do, are your managers equipped to handle diverse issues? There are, there's a whole range of issues that, that can be asked or is there questions that can be asked. And then when you look at and you look at the, the results, you have to look at the data and say, OK, what does that data mean? You have to analyze it and say, what does this data mean? And, and what are the implications for this data in terms of your procedures, your policies, your education, your training? And you can you can really get a get a, get a picture of, of of what's happening. And those results will also tell you the, the efficacy of the diversity person you have in place. Mm. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned social media. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about words versus deeds. So it's real mm. easy. I mean, there's, a whole lot of folks that are out there, you know, posting about black lives matter, um, companies that you never thought would post something like that. Right. Um, posting, uh, but it seems like those are words for some that may be popular in the moment. Right. Or maybe they feel like they need to check that box. And so what, about those companies that are seeking really to truly make a difference. Um, what do you suggest for them beyond just the social media and, and posting the right message? Well, again, it's, it's checking in with your, with your employees and asking them as you did, how are you doing? And really be willing to hear what they have to say to you. And, you're, and there's nothing better than getting the experiential knowledge of people who are living um, what's been happening in society. So listening is huge. Listening and acting is huge. And just understanding that it's it's a marathon. It's not going to, you're not going to make these, these, these grand changes in one day. And then all of a sudden you're, you arrived and everything's fine. It's, it's ongoing and, mm. and things change all the time and you have to pivot and be, and be willing to be flexible and, and a huge part. And I would say um, why it's important too uh, about the leader who leads this, they have to be really, really comfortable in their skin and really, really comfortable with being uncomfortable and being able to address conflict. And if, cause if not people sweep things under the rug all the time. And then next thing you know, you're faced with some kind of lawsuit because you're not, because you're, you're, you have, you have now created or sustained a, a hostile work environment for, 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 for people of color and, and, and not just people of color, but LGBTQ community. You have to address these issues um, head on. Mm. I've had, uh, this goes beyond just companies. So this is also, I think about small business owners and how they relate to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had conversations with, uh, black small business owners that say to me, do you, has it ever occurred to you why I don't have my picture on my business card? Hmm. Because, yeah. I'm, yeah, because I'm concerned about that. I might not get that call, you know, for my services or for my product. Right. Um, and those are, those are eye opening conversations. Um, and so part of it, even if you're a small business owner, you're able, there's a place for those conversations, right? I mean, you, it's, you're not off the hook just because you don't have, uh, a, you know, a lot of employees and, a, you know, diverse group of employees. 
Yeah, that's that's really tough. And and I identify with that. So when I was starting off with my business, it was it was difficult. And I and and I did actually go back and forth. But I said, you know what? It, this I'm speaking for myself. Mm-hmm. I said, you know what? I'm going to just put my picture there. I'm going to just say this is who I am. I'm not going to deny who I am. And and quite frankly, if someone doesn't want to do business with me because of how I look, then I don't even want your money. Like not all not all money is good in my in my opinion. And so I, I'm I'm saying that I, I'm, I can, I'm thinking back to when like as a as a as a so-called hungry entrepreneur and just starting out. I can see I can, I can see that retrospectively, um, but ultimately I think people just do people have to do things within their own comfort zone and and whatever makes them feel feel okay. I remember uh, attending a conference and there was a, a black woman who owned a business and she was married to a white man. I remember her saying that she would send her white husband to get the contracts initially. Mm. And then, and then they would recognize over time that she was behind the scenes or that she was actually the owner. And I, and I get it. And, and it makes sense because unfortunately, again, people have the assumption, oh, it's black owned. Oh, it cannot be run well. Oh, they must be, you know, not, they're not above board. I mean, there's, there's, there's all these stereotypes that play into it. So I, so I, so I, I, to, I totally get it. But over time, it just got, for me, it got exhausting. And I said, you know what? I'm going to just, I'm put it out there. And I, I ended up meeting people like you. And, um, and that's, and that, and, you know, I had a very thriving and successful consulting business. Well, I guess the, 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 and I'm coming at it from the point of view of a white man. I mean, I'm challenging folks, um, that are white to have, that are small business owners to go have those conversations with their, uh, black small business, fellow small business owners, and uh, to understand some of the things that they deal with that are exhausting that you as a white business owner do not have to deal with as tough as what you think you've got. There are some things you don't have to deal with. And that's true. And, and, and I think we've had these conversations, we had a similar conversation, but the, and we, I know you're, you're the expert in terms of, of, of setting your pay, right? Pricing. Or your rate. Right. And we've had discussions because, mm-hmm. you know, uh, this is another another um, um, extension of this conversation is because you're black owned business mm. that people want to lowball you. Right. Right. And that happened over and over again. And then eventually it's like, you know what? I, I can't. I know my worth. I know what I have to offer. And so if you're not going to pay me my rate, then we can't do business. Mm-hmm. And I had to turn down a lot of a lot of things because people expect you to, to, to either lower your rate and, or volunteer your time. And it's, Oh, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? It's like, I understand that there's, there's a conversation and maybe if there's a, if there's some kind of reciprocity, but if it's over, if it keeps continuing on, then maybe say, you know what? I should actually compensate you for, for, for all the time that you're spending talking to all your, your people and giving advice. So, mm-hmm. and, and, because you wouldn't do that with a lawyer, right? right. It's, also, it's also it's also the, the profession, but but yeah. but so I, so so to your point, my advice for a lot of these business owners is to be cognizant of that and say, ask people what what can I do to support you, and I would even go even step further. I saw a couple of days ago Sephora, the the um, the makeup place, uh, they decided to allocate fifteen percent uh, of their of their shelf space to minority owned businesses. And so that's been a, a movement that um, a lot of these corporations are doing now. They're now starting to expand and, and now inviting in uh, businesses of color to be to 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 be sold and through their, their businesses. So the same can be done in terms of in, in this context, because there are a lot of really incredible people doing great work, running great businesses, and they just happen to be of color. For certain, and it should be, and it should not be a disqualifier. Absolutely, and I think this is, uh, well, this is true for all young people. <laughs> Let's just say <laughs> that, right? Because there's some unconscious bias that goes on uh, from uh, folks that are my my vintage. I'm not going to say what that is, but it's it's too because it's too old. <laughs> it's too old, Dion. But uh, no, that, you're not. <laughs> that that think um, uh, you know all oh, those millennials, right? Uh, um, but there's a special burden 
uh, that a, a young black man that's in business carries a young black woman um, because you're, you're mixing in the youth and their blackness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say that, um, well, I, I'll just, I'll, I can talk about my, my oldest daughter. She's 16 and she's, um, I can't think she's a, she's not a millennial. She's a, I think she's a Gen Z, but she's, but she, she gets it. She's really, she's quite the activist actually. Mm. And, um, and all about social justice. And it's just remarkable to hear her, hear her speak. Mm -hmm. And so the way that I've raised her is to, to understand who she is, embrace herself as a, as a black woman, uh, uh, but also to, to, to be open to other cultures as, as I am. And so speaking to her, she has, I mean, every type of person you can think of as friends, as friends, including also um, people from, you know, the LGBTQ community. Like she's, she just has a, she's an open heart and back to both my girls. Mm. And I love that. And, I, and it's interesting. She shared this to me with me a couple of days ago. Um, her name was Ella. So Ella said to me, she goes, mommy, she goes, I don't, I'm not understanding. She goes, even the white people who actually get it are trying hard to not appear racist because of what happened with mm. George Floyd. And that was like so profound, so profound and deep. And so what she was saying is what, what, what she was saying is she has friendships. She's got people that's, that are in her lives that she doesn't think are, are thinking of her as being less than, but because of what happened, people are now kind of working overtime and they're trying not to appear a certain way when they're already not that way. If, if that, if that makes, if that makes sense. Sure. And, and I share that too, because I think that the, the millennials, even though they may be um, part of different demographics and, and you mentioned the black men, the black women, mm -hmm. but I think, and I'm not saying that they, they don't experience racism. They probably do, but I, but I think they're, they're, they are, the younger people are so refreshingly open <laughs> Mm. and and not as hung up with race the way our generations are right and so that and, and that's encouraging um and that is exciting and then that's indicative we can see that that's indicative of, of how people are marching you can see um just just how diverse people are marching in the streets the, the protests we have all different types of people that are, that are marching and, 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 and kneeling and even police officers and conversations. And it's not even long racial lines. And I think I start off by saying what happened there, this is right or wrong. And I said, if you look at that, if you look at what happened and you still don't get it, that it was wrong, then something, something's up. And I think right or wrong transcends anything, any difference that we have. Right. It's, what happened there was wrong and it cannot be trivialized. We're speaking with Dr. Dion Poulton, and she is the chief diversity officer at Care New England and the author of a forthcoming book that she won't like let me get into right now. But I <laughs> see, I'm trying to reel you in for whatever that book comes out. Okay. But she's also the author of, uh, uh, of a book called it's not always racist but sometimes it is and I, a book that i highly recommend um dion this has been great and i really you, you're obviously extraordinarily busy right now and i really appreciate your time um uh being here uh, i guess why don't you sum up kind of what your thoughts are on where 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 we are and 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 what what do you what do you recommend? I mean, we, you, we, we talked about listening to people. We've talked about stepping out. We talked about listening with a non judgmental presence, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. but what else do you recommend folks do that, um, feel like, Hey, I'm, I'm behind and I need to understand. Well, I think, um, educating ourselves is, is a good thing. Uh, continue reading and um, and just seeking out opportunities to talk to people, different people, because I, I do think that time, um, you know, you can you can learn a lot more from the the, the personal anecdotes of, of, of people than just, you know, going to a book and just 
you know, and just reading it. So engaging in conversations and, and coming to it, coming to these conversations, curious and saying, you know what, I don't have all the answers. Mm. Um, can I just, can, can I talk to you? I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know what, just, I think it's just having authentic conversations will, will definitely help. And I'll just also echo what I said earlier is I think we're now in a moment where we need to start recognizing who's on the margins, who doesn't have the opportunities. Mm. So my kids always joke with me, actually my, my family does whenever I, even before this, every time I go into a restaurant, if I ever have a, a black male um, um, waiter or wait uh, in, in particular, I always tip him and tip him extremely well. Mm. And why? Because John, I know what it's like, the difficulty that black men in particular go through in society. And so for him to be there working and fighting against the stereotype mm. and just doing the right thing, I like to, I like to support. So in that regard, it's good to, you can support people. And so the businesses seek out different types of people to support your, your, your work and your endeavors, get a, get a diverse, a diverse client to, to come in and, and do it and do a consulting gig for you. There are many things that, that, that you can do. Well, this has been great. And, uh, you know, I, if someone wants to reach out to you, uh, are you open to that and how can they do that? Sure. So I still have my, um, my, my business email. So, um, it's Dion at Poulton consulting group.com. And, uh, I'm on LinkedIn at Dr. Dion Poulton and also on Twitter and, um, you could, yeah, if you just, um, you can Google and you can, you can, you can certainly find, um, a way to reach me and also through you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, that's true. Um, well, this is, this is awesome. Uh, care new England is, do they know how lucky they are to have you? Oh, that's a sweet question. Um, you have to ask them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I bet they already do. But I, I think, I, I think so. It's, it's a great environment. It's, um, really great people trying to do the right thing. There are four hospitals and three medical centers across Rhode Island. So it's, it's a, it's a big job and we're doing a lot of great work and, um, and they're committed to fighting health disparities and, and making sure that everybody has equal an equal shot at healthcare. So it's, it's a great place to be. That's awesome. Well, uh, grateful for you. Grateful for your work, Dr. Dion Poulton. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. Good to see you again, John. Great to see you too folks just a reminder you can find this show on any of the major podcast platforms that would include apple stitcher google spotify iheart radio um do i have to go on i mean they're on we're on all those platforms uh and you can find us at north fulton by searching north fulton business radio that's how you can find us on any of those platforms we'd love it if you could uh, give us a nice review because it helps uh, folks find the show and uh, promote the great work of folks like uh, Dr. Dion Poulton and the other business leaders that we've had over the last four years. Uh, you can also go to NorthFultonBusinessRadio.com and find our show archive there as well. On LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, uh, we're at North Fulton BRX on all those platforms. So for my guest, Dr. Dion Poulton, I'm John Ray. Join us next time here on North Fulton Business Radio.